Hi, I'm Ian Keller. Welcome to session nine of the Systematic Review module. Today I'm going to be talking about the Mixed Methods Appraisal tool and covering some more of the Prisma 2020 reporting guidelines. So in terms of the module overview, we're doing a bit of data extraction and a bit of risk of bias in that we're doing the quality appraisal with the Mixed Methods Appraisal tool but we're also doing a little bit of writing up using Prisma and data synthesis because we're looking at Prisma again. Next week, we'll do the last bits of Prisma and talk about synthesizing your results. So this week, you should be able to add to your CV that you're able to undertake data extraction and make risk of bias judgments. So the prerequisites for this session are that all screening is complete, Clarify the clear primary outcome with your supervisor, that you've amended your data extraction form and confirmed this with your PGTA and supervisor, and that you have double extracted one manuscript as a team to calibrate your data extraction processes. Now, although last week I said that you needed to finish data extraction of all studies, in reality, I know that you're all still doing it. We're really at a stage where we're in the middle of data extraction. We're at the middle of data extraction and we're in the middle of doing risk of bias or, as follows today, mixed methods appraisal tool. So what is the mixed methods appraisal tool? It's a critical appraisal tool designed for the appraisal stage of systematic reviews of mixed study designs. So reviews that cover qualitative, quantitative and mixed method studies and it permits us to appraise the methodological properties or qualities of five categories of studies. Qualitative research, randomised control trials, non-randomised studies, quantitative descriptive studies, and mixed method studies. The mixed method appraisal tool was developed in 2006, and if you look for the Plurier et al. paper from 2009, it's reported in there. And it was revised in 2011 and looked for the Pace et al. paper. The present version uh, was developed in 2008 on the basis of a literature review of critical appraisal tools, interviews with mixed methods appraisal tool users, a consensus exercise, so a Delphi study with international experts. This has been part of an improvement process that's iterative. So the MMAT will continue to be revised. In terms of what the MMAT can be used for, it can be used to appraise the quality of empirical studies. In other words, empirical research based on experiment, observation or simulation. It can't be used for non-empirical papers such as review or, or theoretical papers. The MMAT allows for the appraisal of most common types of study methodologies and designs. So what are the requirements for the use of the MMAT? Well. Because critical appraisal is about making judgments, it's required that you have at least two reviewers independently involved in the appraisal process. So how does the MMAT work? Well, first of all, you're asked two questions. Question one, are there clear research questions? And question two, do the data allow to address the research questions and these are screening questions so you respond to these two screening questions responding no or can't tell to one or both questions and if that's the case the the study cannot be appraised using the MMAT subsequently for the studies that have got through that stage you need to choose the appropriate category of studies to appraise so you then look at the descriptions of the methods used in the included studies and use an algorithm or a decision tree to decide which of the sets of methods appraisal questions to use. So you follow a decision tree, decide the category of study design you are looking at, and in each case, there are five subsequent questions to look at after deciding. You then, rate these questions or criteria in the chosen category. For example, if the paper is qualitative, a qualitative study, you only rate the five criteria in the qualitative category. 
The can't tell response category means the paper doesn't report the appropriate information to answer yes or no, or that the report has unclear information related to the criterion. Rating can't tell could lead you to look for companion papers or to contact the authors for more information for clarification when needed. In the guidance document you'll use, there are in-depth explanations for the criteria. The explanations aren't exhaustive and not all of them are necessary. However, if you find some of the criteria ambiguous, as with the screening process, you should agree amongst your study team what's important for you to consider in your review question and apply additions to the criteria uniformly across all the included studies from the same category. And you should provide guidance on your document so that those making those judgments can follow the same approach. So category one is qualitative research. And this is an approach for exploring and understanding the meaning individuals or groups ascribe to a social or human problem. Common qualitative research approaches include ethnography. So this is where the aim of the study is to describe or interpret the shared cultural behaviour of a group of individuals. Phenomenology. This is where the study focuses on the subjective experience and interpretations of a phenomenon encountered by individuals. Narrative research. This is where a study analyzes the life experiences of an individual or group. Grounded theory. This is where there is generation of theory from data in the process of conducting research. Case study. This is an in-depth exploration or explanation of issues intrinsic to a particular case. The case can be anything from decision-making process uh, to a person, to an organisation or a country. Qualitative description. There is no specific methodology, but a qualitative data collection and analysis. For example, in-depth interviews or focus groups or hybrid thematic analysis, um, inductive or deductive. So what are the methodological quality criteria for qualitative studies? 1.1, is the qualitative approach appropriate to answer the research question? So for this, the qualitative approach used in the study should be appropriate for the research question and problem. For example, the use of a grounded theory approach should address the development of a theory and ethnography should study human cultures and societies. This criterion is important to add since there is only one category of criteria for qualitative studies compared to three for quantitative studies. 1.2. Are the qualitative data collection methods adequate to address the research question? This criterion is related to the data collection method, including data sources, for example, documents or archives, used to address the research question. To judge this criterion, consider whether the method of data collection, e.g. in-depth interviews or group interviews or observation, or the form of the data, tape recordings, video recordings, diaries, photos, field notes, are adequate. Also, clear justifications are needed when data collection methods are modified during the study. Item 1.3, are the findings adequately derived from the data? This criterion is related to the data analysis used. Several data analysis methods have been developed and their use depends research question and qualitative approach. For example, open, axial and selective coding is often associated with grounded theory and within and cross case analysis is often seen in case study. Item 1.4. Is the interpretation of the results sufficiently substantiated by the data? The interpretation of results should be supported by the data collected. For example, the quotes provided to justify the themes should be adequate. Item 1.5. Is the coherence between the qualitative data sources, collection, analysis and interpretation? There should be clear links between data sources, collection, analysis and interpretation. So category two are randomised control trials. Randomised control trials are studies in which participants or clusters are allocated to an intervention or control group 
by randomization. So the intervention or the, you're allocated to it by the researchers as opposed to you find you're in that condition for another reason. So for example, um, uh, say some researchers want to compare the effective implementation, implementation of a new transport strategy um, in a city and they compare one city to another match control city, that doesn't meet that criteria because the study wasn't responsible for allocating people to that exposure. Looking at this decision tree, the question is, is it quantitative? Is there a comparison of outcomes where people are assigned to condition by researchers? That makes it experimental and not observational. And more than one group is studied with random allocation. So that puts you in this category. What are the methodological quality criteria for randomized control trial? First one is, is randomization appropriately performed? And the explanation for that is, in a randomized control trial, the allocation of a participant or data collection unit, i.e. cluster like school or hospital, into the interventional control group is based solely on chance. That's what you're looking for. Researchers should describe how the randomization schedule was generated, a simple statement such as was randomly generated or using a randomized design is insufficient to judge if randomization was appropriately performed. Also, assignment that is predictable such as using odd or even number records or dates is not appropriate. At a minimum, a simple allocation should be performed using a predetermined plan or sequence. It's usually achieved by referring to a published list of random numbers or using a list of random assignments generated by a computer. Also, restricted allocation can be performed, such as blocked randomization to ensure particular allocation ratios to the intervention groups, stratified randomization, randomization performed separately within strata or minimization to make small groups as similar as possible with respect to several characteristics. Another important characteristic to judge if randomization was appropriately performed is allocation concealment that protects allocation sequence until allocation. Researchers and participants should be unaware of the assignment sequence up to the point of allocation. Several strategies can be used to ensure allocation concealment, such as relying on essential randomization by a third party or use, use of sequentially numbered opaque sealed envelopes. And we covered all that last week in the risk of bias two session. The next criteria is, are the groups comparable at baseline? So what we're looking for, Baseline imbalances between groups suggest that there are problems with the randomization. Now, we covered this in detail last week. And remember, differences that are just due to chance are possible. So you don't immediately write off a study because there is a small difference at random at chance, even if it, that difference might be significant. Indicators from baseline imbalance include unusually large differences in the intervention group sizes, a substantial excess in statistically significant differences in baseline characteristics greater than would be expected by chance alone, imbalancing key prognostic factors or baseline measures of outcome variables that are unlikely to be due to chance, excessive similarity in baseline characteristics that's not compatible with chance, surprising absence of one or more key characteristics that would be expected to be reported. Criterion three, are there complete outcome data? Almost all of the participants contributed to almost all of the measures that would be ideal. There is no absolute and standard cutoff value for acceptable complete outcome data. So you should look for standards in your literature. You should see what is considered complete outcome data in your field and apply this uniformly across all the included studies. For instance, in the literature, acceptable complete data values range from 80 to 95%. Similarly, different acceptable withdrawal dropout rates have been suggested, 5%, 20%, and 30% for a follow-up of more than one year. Criterion 2.4, are outcome assessors blinded to the intervention provided? 
Outcome assessors should be unaware of who is receiving which interventions. The assessors can be participants if using participant recorded outcomes, e.g. pain. The intervention provider or other persons not involved in the intervention. Criterion 2.5. Did participants adhere to the assigned intervention? To judge this criterion, consider the proportion of participants who continued with their assigned intervention throughout to follow up. Lack of adherence includes imperfect compliance, cessation of the intervention, crossover to the comparator intervention and switch to another active intervention. Quantitative non-randomised studies are defined as any quantitative studies estimating the effectiveness of an intervention or studying other exposures that do not use randomization to allocate units to comparison groups. This one is the end result of lots of flows down this decision tree, but basically, if people aren't allocated to a condition, or if they're recruited, but then it's not randomly allocated to more than one condition, it's this. The methodological quality criteria for quantitative non-randomized studies. The first these 3.1 is, are the participants representative of the target population? Indicators of representativeness include clear descriptions of the target population and of the sample, so the inclusion and exclusion criteria, reasons why certain eligible individuals chose not to participate, and any attempts to achieve a sample of participants that represent the target population. 3.2. Are measurements appropriate regarding both the outcome and the intervention or exposure? Indicators of appropriate measurements include that the variables are clearly defined and accurately measured, that the measurements are justified and appropriate for answering the research questions, and that the measurements reflect what they're supposed to measure so that they're validated and Reliability tested measures of the intervention and exposure and outcome of interest are used, or variables are measured using gold standard. 3.3 Are there complete outcome data? 3.3 Are there complete outcome data? Almost all participants contributed to almost all measures is the ideal standard. There is no absolute and standard cutoff value for acceptable complete outcome data. Agree amongst the team what is considered complete outcome data in your field. Apply this uniformly to all the included studies. For example, in the literature, acceptable complete data values range from 80% to 95%. Similarly, different acceptable withdrawal rates have been suggested. 20% and 30% for follow-up for more than one year. 3.4 are the confounders accounted for in the design and analysis? Confounders are factors that predict both the outcome of interest and the intervention received or exposure at baseline. They can distort the interpretation of findings and need to be considered in the design and analyses of non-randomized studies. Confounding bias is low if there is no confounding expected or that appropriate methods to control for confounders are used, such as stratification, regression, matching, standardization, and inverse probability weighting. Criterion 3.5. During the study period, is the intervention administered or exposure occurred as, as intended? For intervention studies, Consider where the participants are treated in a way that is consistent with the planned intervention. Since the intervention is assigned by researchers, consider whether there was a presence of contamination, e.g. the control group may be indirectly exposed to the intervention or whether unplanned co-interventions were present in one group. For observational studies, consider changes occurred in the exposure status among the participants. If yes, Check if these changes are likely to influence the outcome of interest were adjusted for or whether unplanned co-exposures were present in one group. Category for quantitative descriptive studies. So these are primarily cross-sectional analytic studies. 
So this is a caveat to my last one. If there's no before and after comparison, then this is the characteristic, this is the category that you're looking for. So these are studies where it's at one particular time, you're looking at the relationship between health-related factors and outcome and other factors, so the intervention or exposure. The frequency of outcomes is compared in different population subgroups depending on the presence or absence of a level, level of intervention or exposure. Those are the sort of study designs you're looking for. What are the methodological quality criteria for quantitative descriptive studies? First is 4.1. Is the sampling strategy relevant to address the research question? Sampling strategy refers to the way that the sample was selected. There are two categories of sampling strategies, probability sampling involving random, random selection and non-probability sampling. Depending on the research question, probability sampling might be preferable. Non-probability sampling does not provide equal chance of being selected. To judge this criterion, consider whether the source of the sample is relevant to the target population. A clear justification of the sample frame used is provided or the sampling procedure is adequate. 4.2, is the sample representative of the target population? There should be a match between respondents and the target population. Indicators of representativeness include a clear description of the target population and of the sample, such as the respective sizes and inclusion and exclusion criteria, reason why certain eligible individuals chose not to participate and any attempts to achieve a sample of participants that represents the target population. 4.3. Are the measurements appropriate? Indicators of appropriate measurements to include the variables are clearly defined and accurately measured, the measurements are justified and appropriate for answering the research question, the measurements reflect what they're supposed to measure, Validated and reliability tested measures of the outcome of interest to use. Variables are measured using gold standards or questionnaires are pre-tested prior to data collection. 4.4. Is the risk of non-response bias low? Non-response bias consists of an error of non-observation reflecting an unsuccessful attempt to attain the desired information from an eligible unit. To judge this criterion, consider whether respondents and non-respondents are different on the variable of interest. This information might not always be reported in a paper. Some indicators of non-response bias can be considered, such as a low non-response rate. The non-response bias might not be pertinent for case series and case reports. This criterion could be adapted. For instance, complete data on the cases might be important to consider in these designs. Criterion 4.5. Is the statistical analysis appropriate to answer the research question? The statistical analyses used should be clearly stated and justified in order to judge if they are appropriate for the design and research questions, and if any problems with data analysis limited the interpretation of the results. So this is the last of the five categories, mixed methods, and this is where quant and qual are used together to explain things and it can be a mix of qual plus any of the quant methods. So what are the methodological quality criteria for mixed methods design? 5.1, is there an adequate rationale for using a mixed methods design to address the research question? The reasons for conducting a mixed methods study should be clearly explained. Several reasons can be invoked, such as to enhance or build upon qualitative findings with quantitative results and vice versa or to provide a comprehensive and complete understanding of a phenomenon, or to develop and test instruments. 5.2. Are different components of the study effectively integrated to answer the research questions? Integration is a core component of mixed methods research and is defined as the explicit interrelating of the quantitative and qualitative components of a mixed methods study. Look for information on how qualitative and quantitative phases, results and data were integrated. For instance, how data gathered by both research methods was brought together to form a complete picture, e.g. Joint, joint displays, and when integration occurred, e.g. during the data collection analysis or during the interpretation of qualitative and quantitative results. 5.3. Are the outputs of integration of qualitative and quantitative components 
adequately interpreted. This criterion is related to meta-inference, which is defined as the overall interpretations derived from integrating qualitative and quantitative findings. Meta-inference occurs when the interpretation of the findings from the integration of the qualitative and quantitative components shows the added value of conducting a mixed method study rather than having two separate studies. 5.4. Are divergences and inconsistencies in qualitative and quantitative results adequately addressed? When integrating the findings from the qualitative and quantitative components, divergences and inconsistencies, sometimes called conflicts or contradictions or discordances, discrepancies and dissonances, can be found. It's not sufficient to only report the divergences. They need to be explained. Different strategies to address the divergences have been suggested, such as reconciliation, initiation, bracketing, and exclusion. Rate this criterion yes if there is no divergence. 5.5. Do the different components of the study adhere to the quality criteria of each tradition of the methods involved? The quality of qualitative and quantitative components should be individually appraised so that no important threats to trustworthiness are present. To appraise 5.5, use the criteria for the qualitative component, so 1.1 to 1.5, and the appropriate criteria for the quantitative component, such as 2.1 to 2.5, or 3.1 to 3.5, or 4.1 to 4.5. The quality of both components should be high for the mixed method study to be considered of good quality. The premise is that the overall quality of a mixed method study cannot exceed the quality of its weakest component. For example, if the quantitative component is rated high quality and the qualitative component is rated low quality, the overall rating for this criterion will be of low quality. The document that you'll find linked or in the materials folder comprises of two parts. The checklist and the explanation of the criteria, which I've just described to you, and then the form for responding to the questions. In the bit where you respond to questions, you get the screening questions initially, which are described, and then you go on to the criteria for the different types of studies. So. Just as when you were doing data extraction or screening, the way you approach this is you double score this, then discuss it and resolve differences. In terms of then how you approach summarizing these scores or these judgments, there is no summary overall score like there is with risk of bias it's discouraged to calculate an overall score from the ratings of each criterion. Instead, it's advised to provide a detailed presentation of the ratings on each criterion to better inform your description of the included studies. You may subsequently perform a sensitivity analysis, but the authors of this tool discourage excluding studies with low methodological quality. We'll come back to the question of how we might use this tool in synthesis next week. So now on to Prisma 2020. Now I think I've given you some overview of reporting guidelines in previous weeks, but just to kind of give another overview, Prisma 2020 is published as a suite of three papers. A statement paper that contains the 27 item checklist, which you can see beside me. An expanded checklist which details the reporting recommendations for each item, which is kind of like the crib sheet from the Risk of Bias 2 guidance, the Prisma 2020 abstract checklist, and the revised flow diagram. A development paper, which outlines the steps to update the Prisma 2009 statement and provides rationale for the modifications to the original items, and the updated explanation and elaboration for TWIS Prisma 2020, which explains why reporting of the item is recommended, presents bullet points that detail the reporting item, reporting recommendations. Today, I will mostly outline the detail from the crib sheet. 
But where I feel like you can do with some more detail, I'll draw on the explanation and elaboration document. I'm going to call it the E and E document to save my voice. I promise if I say anything that seems unclear, if you look in the Prisma E and E document, you'll find the what, why, and examples. And it'll make the write up like painting by numbers. I should say I'm going to miss out some of the detail because some of it isn't relevant for this course. For example, the detail of what websites and registers do you search. Well, none of you searched websites or registers, registers. But if you did, look in the Prisma E and E doc, and you'll find the detail you need there. Item one: the title. Identify the report as a systematic review in the title, because this facilitates identification by potential users and appropriate indexing in databases. Terms such as review. Literature review, evidence synthesis, knowledge synthesis are not recommended because they don't distinguish between systematic and non-systematic approaches. It's discouraged to use the terms systematic review and meta-analysis interchangeably, interchangeably because the systematic review refers to the entire set of processes used to identify, select and synthesize evidence, whereas meta-analysis refers only to the statistical synthesis. Furthermore, meta-analysis can be done outside of the context of systematic review, for example, when researchers meta-analyse the results from a limited set of studies that they have conducted. The essential elements for this item are that you identify the report as a systematic review in the title, report an informative title that provides key information about the main objective or question that the review addresses. For reviews of interventions, this usually includes the population and the intervention that the review addresses. Additionally, consider providing additional information in the title, such as the method of analysis used, for example, a systematic review with meta-analysis. The designs of the included study, such as a systematic review of randomized trials, or an indication that review is an update of an existing review or a continually updated living systematic review. Item two relates to abstracts. The abstract checklist contains the following items. Identify the report as a systematic review. Provide an explicit statement of the main objectives or questions that the review addresses. Specify the inclusion exclusion criteria for the review. Specify the information sources, such as the databases and registers that were used to identify studies, and the date when each was last searched. Specify the methods used to assess risk of bias in the included studies. Specify the methods used to present and synthesize the results. Give the total number of included studies and participants and summarize the relevant characteristics of the study. Present results for the main outcomes preferably indicating the number of included studies and participants for each. Now, I'm not asking any of you to do this, but if a meta-analysis was done, report the summary estimates and confidence credible interval if comparing groups indicate the direction of the effect, i.e. which group is favoured. Provide a brief summary of the limitations of the evidence included in the review, such as study risk of bias, inconsistency and imprecision. Provide a general interpretation of the results and important implications. Specify the primary source of funding for the review, so that's not relevant for any of us. Provide the register name and registration number. I've not asked any of you to do that, so we're going to ignore that. Now, why do you need these things? An abstract providing key information about the main objectives or questions that the review addresses, the methods, results and implications of the findings should help readers decide whether to access the full report. For some readers, the abstract may be all that they have access to, so it's critical that the results presented for all the main outcomes for the review objectives or questions, regardless of statistical significance, magnitude or direction of effect. Terms presented in the abstract will be used to index a systematic review in bibliographic databases. Therefore, reporting keywords that accurately describe the review question, such as population, interventions, and outcomes is recommended. The next two items relate to the introduction. So item three, describe the rationale for the review in the context of existing knowledge. 
Describing the rationale should help readers understand why the review was conducted and what the review might add to existing knowledge. So it's essential that you describe the current state of knowledge and its uncertainties, articulate why it's important to do the review. If other systematic reviews addressing the same or a largely similar question are available, explain why the current review was considered necessary. For example, previous reviews were out of date or have discordant results, new review methods are available to address the review question, existing reviews are methodologically flawed, or the current review was commissioned to inform a guideline or policy for a particular organisation. If the review is an update or replication of a particular systematic review, indicate this and cite the previous review. If the review examines effects of interventions, also briefly describe how the intervention examined might work. Consider presenting a logic model or theory of change to display visually the hypothesis relationship between the intervention components and outcome. Item four, provide an explicit statement of the objectives or questions the review addresses. An explicit and concise statement of the review objectives or questions will help readers understand the scope of the review and assess whether the methods used in the review, such as the eligibility criteria, the search methods, data items, and the comparisons used in the synthesis adequately address the objective. Such statements can be written in the form of objectives. The objectives of this review were to examine the effects of, or as questions, what are the effects of? It's essential that you provide an explicit statement of all objectives or questions the review addresses, expressed in terms of a relevant question formulation framework. And I've linked to one of those in previous weeks when we were looking at PICOs, but I will put those in the session materials. If the purpose is to evaluate the effects of interventions, use the population intervention comparator outcome framework or one of its variants to state the comparisons that will be made. So the rest of the items that I'm going to address today all relate to method section. So item five relates to the eligibility criteria. Specify the inclusion and exclusion criteria for the review and how studies were grouped for the syntheses. Specifying the criteria used to decide what evidence was eligible or ineligible in sufficient detail should enable readers to understand the scope of the review and verify inclusion decisions. The PICO framework is commonly used to structure the reporting of eligibility criteria for the reviews of interventions. In addition to specifying the review PICO, the intervention, outcome, and population groups that were used in the synthesis need to be identified and defined. For example, in a review examining the effects of psychological interventions for smoking cessation in pregnancy, the authors specified intervention groups, counselling, health education, feedback, incentive-based interventions, social support and exercise, and the defining components of each group. It's essential that you specify all study characteristics used to decide whether a study was eligible for inclusion in the review, that is, the components described in the PICO framework or one of its variants, and other characteristics such as eligible study designs, setting, and minimum duration of follow-up. Specify eligibility criteria with regard to report characteristics such as year of dissemination, language and report status, for example, whether reports such as unpublished manuscripts and conference abstracts were eligible for inclusion. Clearly indicate if studies were ineligible because the outcomes of interest were not measured, or ineligible because the results for the outcome of interest were not reported. Reporting that studies were excluded because they had no relevant outcome data is ambiguous and should be avoided. Specify any groups used in the synthesis such as intervention, outcome or population groups, and link these to comparisons specified in the objective. Item six relates to information sources. Specify all databases, registers and websites, organisations, reference lists and other sources searched or consulted to identify studies. Specify the date when each source was last searched or consulted. Authors should provide a detailed description of the information sources such as bibliographic databases, registers and reference lists that were searched or consulted, including the date when each source was last searched, to 
allow readers to assess the completeness and currency of the systematic review and facilitate updating. Authors should fully report the what, when and how of the sources searched. The what and when are covered in item 6 and the how is covered in item 7. It's essential that you specify the date when each source was last searched or consulted. If bibliographic databases were searched, specify each database by name, such as Medline or Sinal, the interface or platform through which the database was searched, e.g. Ovid or EBSCOhost, and the dates of coverage. If individuals were contacted to identify studies, specify the types of individuals contacted, such as authors of studies included in the review or researchers with expertise in the area. If reference lists were examined, specify the types of references examined, such as references cited in study reports included in the review. Item 7 relates to search strategies. Present the full search strategy for all databases, registers and websites, including any filters and limits used. Reporting the full details of search strategies, such as the full line-by-line -line search strategy as run in each database, should enhance the transparency of a systematic review, improve replicability and enable a review to be more easily updated. Presenting only one search strategy for amongst several hinders readers' ability to assess how comprehensive the searches were. It does not provide them with the opportunity to detect any errors. Furthermore, making only one search strategy available limits replication or updating the searches in other databases, as the search strategies would need to be reconstructed through adaptation of the ones made available. As well as reporting the search strategy, a description of the search strategy development process can help readers judge how far the strategy is likely to have identified all studies relevant to the review's inclusion criteria. The description of the search strategy development process might include details of the approaches used to identify keywords, synonyms, or subject indexing terms used in the search strategies, or any processes used to validate or peer review the search strategies. Empirical evidence suggests that peer review of search strategies is associated with improvement of search strategies, leading to retrieval of additional relevant records. It's essential that you provide full line-by-line -line search strategy as run in each database with a sophisticated interface such as Ovid, or the sequence of terms that were used to search simpler interfaces such as search engines or websites. Describe any limits applied to the search strategy, such as data language, and justify these by linking back to the review's eligibility criteria. If published approaches, such as search filters designed to retrieve specific types of records, for example, a filter for randomized control trials, or search strategies from other systematic reviews are used, cite them. If published approaches were adapted, for example, if existing search filters were amended, note the changes made. If natural language processing or text frequency analyses tools were used to identify or refine keywords, synonyms, or subject indexing terms to use in the search strategy, specify the tools used. And I know some of you use tools to identify subject headings, and I think some of you might have used word frequency analysis off the SR Accelerator website. So if you use those, this is where you report that. If a tool was used to automatically translate search strings from one database to another, specify the tool used, e.g. polyglot search, and I know many of us use that. If the search strategy was validated, for example, by evaluating whether it could identify a set of clearly eligible studies, report the validation process used and specify which studies were used in the validation set. So I know some of us did that. If the search strategy was peer-reviewed, report the peer review process and specify any tool used, such as peer review of electronic search strategies. That's the press checklist, which we all use. If the search strategy structure adopted was not based on a PICO-style approach, describe the final conceptual structure and any explorations that were undertaken to achieve it. Item 8 relates to selection processes. Specify the methods used to decide whether a study met the inclusion criteria of the review, including how many reviewers screened each record and each report retrieved, whether they worked independently, and, if applicable, details of any automation tools used in the process. 
Study selection is typically a multi-stage process in which potentially eligible studies are first identified from screening titles and abstracts, then assessed through full text review and, when necessary, contact with study investigators. Increasingly, a mix of approaches might be applied. Essential elements for systematic reviews, regardless of the selection process used, authors should describe in detail the process used for deciding how records retrieved by the search were considered for inclusion in the review to enable readers to assess the potential for errors in selection. It's essential, regardless of what approach was used, to report how many reviewers screened each record, title and abstract, and each report retrieved. Whether multiple reviewers worked independently, that is, were un unaware of each other's decisions, and whether multiple reviewers worked independently, that is, were unaware of each other's decisions at each stage of screening or not. For example, records screened by one reviewer and exclusions verified for another, and any processes used to resolve disagreements between screeners, for example, referral to a third reviewer, or by consensus. Report any processes used to obtain or confirm relevant information from study investigators. Now, there is a whole section in Prisma on the use of automation tools. I'm currently using RAN on a funded review with about 12,000 abstracts, not that big but big enough to be a pain. Next year, I will teach use of Rayan. If any of you are planning a subsequent review, sometime between now and next week, I'm gonna be making a video on use of Rayan for my collaborators. And if you want to see it, you're gonna to have to subscribe to my channel. Suffice to say, if you do want to use machine learning as part of your screening process, there's a whole nother section of essential elements on this item that I'm not gonna be describing today. Item nine is on data collection processes, and there we need to specify the methods used to collect data from reports, including how many reviewers collected data from each report, whether they worked independently, any processes for obtaining or confirming data from study investigators, and if applicable, details of automation tools used in this process. Authors should report the methods used to collect data from reports and included studies to enable, to enable readers to assess the potential for errors in the data presented. It's essential that you report how many reviewers collected data from each report, whether multiple reviewers worked independently or not, for example, data collected by one reviewer and checked by another, and any processes used to resolve disagreement between data collectors. Report any processes used to obtain or confirm relevant data from study investigators, such as how they were contacted, what data was sought, and success in obtaining any necessary information. If any automation tools were used to collect data, report how the tool was used, how the tool was trained, and what internal and external validation was done to understand the risk of incorrect extraction. I don't think any of us have done that. If articles required translation into another language to enable data collection, report how these were translated. If any software was used to extract data from figures, specify the software used. If any decision rules were used to select data from multiple reports corresponding to a study, and any steps taken to resolve inconsistency across reports, report the rules and steps used. Item 10A and item 10B both relate to data items. Item 10A is list and define all outcomes from which data was sought, specify whether all reports that were compatible with each outcome domain in each study were sought, for example, for all measures, time points, and analyses, and if not, the methods used to decide which results to collect. And item 10b, list and define all other variables for which data was sought, such as participant and intervention characteristics, funding source. Describe any assumptions made about missing or unclear information. I covered items 10a and b in detail in session seven when I talked about data extraction. So I won't repeat myself. And if you want to hear that information again, go back and watch the video of session seven. Similarly, I went through everything you needed for item 11, specify the methods used to assess risk of bias in the included study, details of the tools used and how many reviewers assessed each study and whether they worked independently and, if applicable, details of automation tools used in the process. If you want reminding of that detail, go back and look at last week's video. Now, Although we talked about data extraction last week, and I talked about the importance of taking care around data, we didn't really talk about effect measures. This was primarily because I was assuming the majority of us will not be doing meta-analyses, and I certainly don't expect it. Item 12 is, 
specify for each outcome the effect measures such as risk ratio, mean difference used in synthesis or presentation of results. This is really for studies that synthesize data using meta-analyses, and we're not using meta-analyses. So instead, I'm going to use item two from SWIM, or Synthesis Without Meta-Analysis, guidelines, which I'll describe in more detail next week when we talk about synthesis in depth and I finish off grids. And this item is item two from SWIM. Describe the standardized metric for each outcome, explain why the metric was chosen, and describe any methods used to transform the intervention effect as reported in the study to the standardized metric, citing any methodological guidance used. The term standardized metric refers to the metric that is used to present intervention effects across the studies for the purpose of synthesis or interpretation or both. Examples of standardized metric include measures of intervention effect such as risk ratios or odds ratios, risk differences, mean differences, standardized mean differences and ratio of mean. Direction of effect or p-values and I think we'll be using direction of effect or p-values. This is another doom quote. I'm not going to read this one out. I just want to remind you that your assessment is based on how successfully you follow these reporting guidelines in your review. Goodness me, that felt like a lot there. But I want to remind you that all that information in more detail is available in the Prisma e and &E guidance, which is going to be in the session materials on Teams and going to be linked below. So. What have you got to do this week? Key thing is to try and get the data extraction of all included studies finished. Now, you might find when you do that, that you come across problems. I understand that will be a really big push, particularly including risk of bias two or mixed methods appraisal tool 2008 judgments. If you could get that all done by next week, that'd be amazing but I'm planning on running a week 11 session as well, which will mostly be troubleshooting. So get as much as you can possibly get done, and then we can make space for the rest of the sessions to focus on write-ups. As usual, thank you so much. I really appreciate how hard you're all working on this. I know it has been an awful lot of work. So thank you for so much for all your effort, and I will see you next week.